Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, this is to distinguish it from Caesarea Maritima, or the one by the Sea of, of uh, by the Mediterranean. He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That is one heavy-duty question. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, come back from the dead, in other words. Some Elias, Elijah the prophet, he said, I'll send him before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. Or others, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, maybe God's raised him up. And brought him back to deliver us. Or one of the prophets. He saith unto them. But whom say ye that I am? This bears on one of the most important things in the Bible. The progressive revelation of God. To his creatures. And Simon Peter answered and said. Thou art the Messiah. Mashiach. The Christ. The anointed one. Now watch this. <coughs> the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. Bar means son, son of Jonah. Calling attention to his earthly birth and attachment for flesh and blood. Earthly attachment, earthly understanding, earthly revelation. Hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father, and to whomsoever he shall reveal him. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my ecclesia, my church, my called out assembly, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Father, bless the book now, and give me the gift of preaching, Lord, in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. You can be seated. I've been to Caesarea Philippi. I've been to Caesarea Maritima. I've been blessed to be there. I took it, counted it, a great privilege and blessing to be at these places. Caesarea Philippi is the headwaters of the Jordan River. The water comes bubbling up out of a mountain, literally, gushing up out of the ground originates at Mount Hermon, far to the north. There the water flows down underneath the ground then comes back up out of the ground, bubbling out into the headwaters of the Jordan River. There, therefore, is a place that the Lord Jesus Christ chose to, to take his disciples and manifest himself, and he said to them, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Here, therefore, we have water, which is a type of life, a type of the power of the Holy Spirit, giving of life, the beginning of the course of life as the Jordan River makes its flowing all the way down and empties into the Dead Sea. And of course they had all kinds of ideas at this time early in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. These disciples knew he was great and they knew he was different. They knew there was something about this man. They even said, never man spake like this man. Who is this man that walks on water, raises the dead, heals the sick, cast out devils? And never man spoke like this man speaks. He speaks with authority, not as the scribes and Pharisees. Undoubtedly there was something obviously different about this man. Who is this man? Well, let me say to you this morning, the most important, important question that you'll ever ask, have asked of you or you'll ever ask yourself is that question. Who is this man? Because he is the sum total, as I said in Sunday school, of all things. He is the beginner and ender of all things. He's the starter and the stopper of everything. He is the alpha and the omega. He's the aleph and the tau. He's the A and the Z of whatever language you care to choose. He is everything there is to be found in between. Everything has its meaning as it relates to him. He is the definition of all terms. Everything can be explained from the one that I'm talking about this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He is Christos, Christ for he is the anointed of God and he will come and manually, physically, violently take the kingdoms of this world and they will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. But I ask you this question this morning. As we come down to the end of the 20th, as the 20th and already started into the 21st century, 
to the end of the church age, to the time as the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I firmly believe that I will see the Lord Jesus Christ come in my short lifetime on this earth. And I do look for his appearing day in and day out. And so I have asked myself this question. Who is this one? Who is this man that was born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea? Did he start then or was he around before Bethlehem of Judea? And did something happen then that is profound that bears on the life of men today? If you study anything, the English language, the King's English, which we all chop up, believe me. And if you get a dictionary and you'll find a word in that dictionary and then it's called semantics. The word semantics means that uh, the meaning of a word is different to different people. In plain of words, read to one may not be, may be read to another, but it's not the same meaning as read. In plain of words, it's a play on meaning. And I have never seen anything as it plays upon the meaning of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is the page of a website. Here is what they say about the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen Carefully, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and the Son of God. He is our Redeemer. The Holy Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ's mother was Mary. His father on earth was Joseph. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, and labored with Joseph as a carpenter. When he turned 30, he began a three-year ministry of teaching, blessing, and healing the people of the Holy Land. He also organized his church and gave his apostles power and authority to assist, to assist in his work. But what do we mean when we say he is the Savior of the world, the Redeemer? Each of these titles point to the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way by which we can return to live with our Heavenly Father. Jesus suffered and was crucified for the sins of the world, giving each of God's children the gift of repentance and forgiveness. Only by his mercy and grace can anyone be saved. His subsequent resurrection prepared the way for every person to overcome physical death as well. These events are called the atonement. In short, Jesus Christ saves us from sin and death. For that, he is very literally our Savior and Redeemer. In the future, Jesus Christ will return to reign on earth in peace. For a thousand years, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he will be our Lord forever. And I'm sure if you heard these words, you'd say to yourself, well, what problem do you find with that preacher? The problem is not what they are saying. The problem is what they mean by what they say because this is the front page of the Mormon website that I just read to you. And this, my friend, should wake you up this morning to understand what I'm talking about. When I use the terminology semantics, when I use the terminology the Lord said to his disciples, who do men say that I am? When somebody says Jesus, are they talking about my Jesus? When somebody says Lord, are they talking about the Lord of glory? When somebody says Redeemer, what do they mean by Redeemer? You are living in a generation where all words don't really have any meaning. So what I do today, I do it by the grace of God. And I firmly believe by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I want the Bible to tell you who this man is. And when the Bible tells me who he is, I don't care what terminology you use and what high sounding words. You can call him Savior and Lord. You can say he's the Redeemer. If you cannot agree with what this book says about him, the spirit that motivates you is the spirit that came straight out of hell itself. Even if you put out a web page like this, and a website that uses all this terminology. I don't think you're talking about the one that I believe in. So let's look at the Bible. Who is Jesus Christ? Some say he's no more than an angel. Some give a definition of an angel as simply merely being a, a messenger. My friend, please understand what the Bible teaches about an angel is vastly more than simply a messenger. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not just simply an angel. Angel of the Lord, yes. In the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ is the angel of the Lord. Some say he's the brother to Satan. This group right here that I read from their webpage just a moment ago, they teach if you want to dig a little further, begin to dig into what they believe, dig into how they define terms, dig into what this step means to them. They teach that Jesus Christ and Satan were brothers. And when they use the term salvation, they don't use it like you use it. You need to understand that you can be deceived by deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The Bible talks about doctrines of devils. 
In the book of Revelation it says three unclean spirits like frogs go out of the mouth of the beast and the false prophet and of the devil. They are lying spirits, the Bible says, that are going forth into the world to deceive men. Some say that he's Michael the archangel. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that the Lord Jesus Christ is Michael the archangel. My friend Michael is an archangel and Michael is an angel of God and Michael does stand for the children of Israel and he is a holy angel of the Lord but he is a created being. The Lord Jesus Christ is not Michael the archangel. Some say he is Ben Pantera. This is found in the Babylonian Talmud. Here is the key to understanding the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is the foundation of Rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism feeds from the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is laid out in encrypted form. Those of you that deal with computers, you know what encryption is. You can create a document and encrypt it and nobody can understand a thing about that document because you are the only one that can unlock the code that encrypts it. A code, therefore, becomes an initiation way. The, pad, the Talmud is encoded. It is full of Jesus Christ, but it's all encoded. It's not for your ears to understand. They know who they're reading about. And the Talmud says that he's demon-possessed, says he was born of a whore, says he was born of a Roman soldier, says he's in hell right now. The Babylonian Talmud teaches all kinds of un godly stuff about the Lord Jesus Christ. You could ask the average Jew about that. He said, well, that, that, his name's not it. What are you talking about? But the idea is this. He is encoded in that book and they know who they're talking about. Then my friend, he is ascended master to some, to this new age group, this, this emerging church, this master guru, these chakras and serpent power that I've been teaching in Sunday school for week after week after week. They teach that the Lord Jesus Christ is nothing more than a shaman that showed up 2,000 years ago that had tapped into the great spiritual power of the universe and he began to show us how that we could do the same thing. They don't have a clue who he is. There are those over here in the halls of learning that take great pride in their achievement that say that Jesus Christ was a great man, that he was a great teacher, a wondrous philosopher, that he laid down a pattern for our lives, that we can learn truly from the great things that he said, blah, 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 blah. That doesn't mean a thing to me. He's not just a great man. Great man, he's the greatest of men that ever lived, but he's more than just a great man. So who is this one that cometh from Bozra with diamonds? garments my friend who is this one that will come riding on a white horse in the book of Exodus chapter number 3 and verse number 14 when Moses stood outside Israel being held captive by Egypt he said when I go to tell them who sent me what will I say to them in chapter number 3 of Exodus in verse 14 God said to Moses you tell them that I am that I am that word translated I am that I am is the Hebrew word haya that word shows up thousands Thousands and thousands and thousands of times in the Old Testament, literally over five thousand times. It's a simple word. It means ever present in the past, ever present in the future, ever present in the present. It means one that is self-existing, one that is from here and everlasting from everlasting to everlasting that needs nothing to exist. He exists because he exists. You go tell the children of Israel that are held captive by the, by the Egyptians that that almighty eternal self-existing one hath sent you. You tell them that I am hath sent you. If I can connect the man that was born in Bethlehem of Judea 2,000 years ago with the one that said to Moses outside Egypt, I am that I am. I got my man. I know who I'm talking about. And when I come to the New Testament book of John chapter number 8 and verse number 58, he said to the apostles, he said, before Abraham was, I am. That I am in Greek is egoimi. It is an emphatic term. He said, I am. He needs nothing else. The Lord Jesus Christ immediately identified himself with the I am of the book of Exodus. In the book of John chapter number 18 verse 58, he said, I have told you that I am he. He, if you'll look in your Bible in John 8, 58, is in italics. It was added for continuity and clarity in the text. He literally said, I have told you that I am. He said to the Jews, if you do not believe that I am, 
You will die in your sins and you will go to hell. He was saying, I am that I am. Friend, he doesn't need anybody to tell me who he is. He just told me that he is that eternal, infinite, almighty God that said to Moses in Exodus, I am that I am. Who is this one that I'm talking about? He said, I am that I am. In the book of Zechariah chapter number 12 and verse number 8, another passage that bears on who he is. Is. This is very important, very important. In Zechariah chapter number 12 and verse 8, In that day shall the Lord Jehovah, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yehoah, yod Heh, vow Heh, the Tetragrammaton, the name of God. Elohim is not his name. Adonai is not his name. His name is Yod, Hey, Vow, Hey. You gotta have Masoretic vowel points to pronounce it. You cannot pronounce two consonants or three consonants. You gotta have A, E, I, O, U, sometimes Y and W. Try reading a word and take the consonants out. You're lost. You can't read it. It's the same with Hebrew. They're consonants and without the Masoretic vowel points, Forget it. You're just looking at letters. And yet, my friend, that tetragrammaton is the four letters of the name of God. And every time in the Old Testament, the King James translators came upon that tetragrammaton. They translated it capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. They wanted you to know, don't make any mistake, that's his name. <laughs> Now, my friend, when you're reading something like that, you can't make a mistake. And so here in Zechariah 8, and look carefully what it says. Chapter number 8 and verse 12, chapter 12, verse 8. In that day shall the Jehovah, the Lord God, defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them on that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God and the angel of Jehovah before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And watch this. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Good night. What are you talking about? Who's talking about being pierced? Jehovah's talking about being pierced. Yod, hey, vow, hey, the very name of Almighty God. He said, they're going to look at me and they pierce me. That is a direct connection. It can't get any directer than that between the one that was nailed on the tree and the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Time and again, Jehovah shows up in the Old Testament. Many times he shows up in the Old Testament in what's called Jehovistic combinations. The word Jehovah is his name, but it's not only his name, it is his covenant name. For at the name of Jehovah, he binds himself to Israel. And he brought them into a covenant relationship with them that nobody else ever enjoyed. All of the benefits of the covenant relationship that Israel enjoyed with the Lord, Jesus, with, with the Lord God through Jehovah are mine today because Jehovah's mine. He belongs to me and I belong to him. Every gift he ever gave Israel was nothing but a shadow compared to what you have in Christ on this day. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. Jehovah Rapha means the Lord that healeth. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord our banner. Jehovah Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh means the Lord that sanctify, set apart, holy, holy, holy. The Lord Jehovah Shalom is the Lord our peace. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Is he your righteousness? Or are you working to make your own righteousness? Do you good enough? You think you're good enough? You belong to some outfit, some clandestine, some dark, some esoteric group where you've hidden from mankind and you believe that some oath you've taken in front of men in that group is going to get you to heaven? Let me tell you plainly, you're going to hell. The only name that can get you through glory is the name of Jesus. I don't care how high you are in your outfit. Jehovah Shammah is the Lord is there. Jehovah Saboeth, the Lord of hosts, and Jehovah Ra. The Lord, my shepherd. Let me ask you something. Will he provide? His name is Jesus. Will he heal? His name is Jesus. Is he a banner? His name is Jesus. I fight under that banner. Is he, does he sanctify you? His name is Jesus. Does he give you peace? His name is Jesus. Is he your righteousness? His name is Jesus. 
And my friend, uh, is he the Lord is there? Is he here? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he is. His name is Jesus. Is he the Lord of hosts? His name is Jesus. For the Bible said, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. Amen. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth come to do what? And do what? Make war. Judge and make war. And then the Lord my shepherd. Is he the good shepherd, chief shepherd, great shepherd? He's all of these things. So whatever Jehovah was in the Old Testament to Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ is that and a hundred thousand fold more to us today. Amen. I have showed you in Scripture how that Jesus Christ is I am. I have showed you in Scripture how that he is Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then my friend in Genesis chapter number one and verse number one, the first book of Scripture, the first word of Scripture, this is the book disdained by the intellectual crowd, by the elitist, and even by the leaders of some of the so-called religious outfits in this world. They don't believe the first four chapters of the book of Genesis have any bearing on reality at all. They think it's nothing more than myth and fable, and that Adam and Eve never really lived. And the Garden of Eden, that never existed. And what is recorded here? Clarence Darrow looked into the face of William Jennings Bryan in Dayton, Tennessee, about 1926, somewhere along in there, and said, Do you believe that the account in Genesis chapter number one is true? William Jennings Bryan looked back at him and said, You better believe I believe it's true. I believe every word of it's true. And let me look at you this morning. I believe it too. I believe that Genesis 1-1 is as true as anything I've ever read. Here's what it says. In the beginning, Elohim, that's the Hebrew word, God, generic term. It can be translated a number of different ways. Not his name, but it's a reference to who he is. In the beginning, God, bara. Hebrew word, bara, translated, created. What does it mean? It doesn't mean to take this and this and create a cross with it or something of that nature. I'm using something that already exists. What it means is in the place where there is no place, in the space where there is no space, in absolute nothingness, let there be. And the moment be came out of his mouth, worlds came into existence to create from nothing. You believe that stuff, preacher? Yes, sir. Yeah. I believe that the creator, ha in Greek it is the ha pantikrator, the one that is the creator brought into existence everything that you even, and many of the things, the Bible said he created all that is visible and invisible. All you've ever seen is the visible. There is a world of invisible that you're not even conscious it's there. You can't put it under your microscope. You can't determine its atomic structure. You can't look at it and analyze it. You don't even know it exists. Yet it's there because he said it's there. So the Bible said he created. Now turn to Colossians chapter number one and verse number 16. Here's what your Bible says about that. Colossians 1.16 For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and before him. And to put the icing on the cake, they couldn't continue to exist unless he maintained them. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And in case you weren't here when we mentioned what laminin was, the cell structure of your body, for your body's made up of cells. Every cell in your body is held together by a cross. You may not know that, but that's true. And I challenge you and dare you to go check me out. 
Just type the word laminin and Google it on the internet. It'll pull up the structure of laminin. And lo and behold, it's shaped like a cross. That's amazing. Coincidental, preacher. Sure. Sure it's coincidental. You want to believe that to ease your mind? But my friend, you got to deal with something here. That could be shaped any, it couldn't even, it not necessarily to have a shape. There's no reason for a shape. You're talking about the structure of something that for thousands of years men never even saw. And now with the help of electron microscopes and the ability to look into that which is, if until this point had been invisible, lo and behold, a whole micro world, microcosm they call it, a micro world is coming into existence and it's held together by the cross. You'd be amazed at how much is held together by the cross. You'd be amazed at how much history is held together by the cross. You'd be amazed at how much my life has been held together by the cross. You'd be amazed at where I'd be right now if it wasn't for the cross. I will glory in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For I am crucified to this world and it to me. In the book of Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 9. Here's what it says about this creator. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In who? In Jesus Christ. And then in Philippians. Some of you weren't here Wednesday night. Some of you were here in Sunday school. Listen carefully. Philippians 2.6. Listen carefully. Please listen to what I'm about to show you in that text. That's one of the most profound things you'll read in your Bible. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? Is he Satan's brother? Is he Michael the archangel? Is he the ascended master? Is he the son of Ben Pantera? Who is this man? Here's what it says in Philippians 2. And verse 6, the Apostle Paul said to the church at Philippi, who being in the morphe of God, metamorphosis is a complete change in the English language. Morphosis has to do with its bearing, its being, its, 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 its presence, what can be seen, what can be known, what can be understood. So a metamorphosis is a complete change. Example, worm crawls. Worm crawls, nothing but an ugly worm one day. And then what happens? That ugly worm turns into a beautiful monarch butterfly. It has gone through a metamorphosis. It has gone through a complete change from a creature that crawls in dirt to one that flies in the wind. A morphe, therefore, has to do with your form, your being. Note carefully what it says in Philippians 2.6. Who being in the form of God. When did that take place? Where is this talking about? This is talking about before he came into the world. When he was in the presence of Michael the archangel. And Gabriel who said I am the one who stands before God. When he was in the presence of the seraphim. And the cherubim. He was in the presence of all of these creatures. That God had made. The only God they had ever seen was him. Yeah, it's quiet in here. I'm taking you where you probably haven't been. Who being in the form of a God. Did I mess up? I just put A. Did that change the meaning? Just a little indefinite article A, that's all, just one little word, just one, not even so much, just a letter. Who being in the form of God. In plain of words, the appearance Presence, understanding, consciousness, comprehend God. Imagine how these angels felt when that one that they knew as God condescended, laid aside his robes of glory and came down into an earth and went into the womb of a virgin and there incarnated himself in human form. And nine months later was born 
of a woman at a virgin birth. You don't believe in the virgin birth? You're no Christian. You're a joke. You're a fool. If you don't believe in the virgin birth and call yourself a Christian, you need to have your head examined. Why would you follow somebody like that? Why would you listen to somebody like that for? Well, I was just patronizing. I know you are. I know you're patronizing the people. You're no Christian. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is born of a virgin, you don't have a clue who he is. God became a man. And he dwelt among us. Who did? God did. Who's Jesus? God. He's God. Now look carefully. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifest in the flesh. I messed up again, didn't I? If you got any Bible outside of the King James Bible, that's what your Bible says or something that relates to that. He who was manifest in the flesh. That didn't mean anything. It didn't say a thing. Your Bible says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Who? God was manifest in the flesh. All right, here so far, here's what we've said. He's the I am of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the Jehovah of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Tetragrammaton refers to but one. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord Jehovah, God is your God. He's one Lord. There's just one God. So far we've said he's I am. We've said he's Jehovah. And we've proven from scripture that he is the creator. Now the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the apocalypsis. The Yesu Christos. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of folks look at it and think it's a revelation that Jesus Christ gives us about the future. What's in the book of Revelation about the future is good, but it's incidental. The purpose of the book of Revelation is to start you off and get you established firmly on who he is. And you can't get it wrong. And if you get that right, and John knew what he was doing, if you get it right, then what's going to happen in the future is important to you. If you don't get it right, just go somewhere and turn the light out and shut the door and get ready for judgment. Look at Revelation 1.8. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 8. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, El Shaddai, the Almighty. Now that's the capstone. That's the capstone. All of the other was the foundation leading you to that. What do you mean, preacher? Listen, somebody said, well, Jesus is God. Yeah, but he's one of the gods. Somebody said, well, Jesus is the Son of God. Sure, and you're a son of God by the new birth. Are you following me? Yeah. Somebody said, well, Jesus is the Savior of the world. Yeah, save you how? Define salvation to me. See what I mean? But when you get to Revelation 1.8, you can't spin it. There's nothing to do with it. You either believe it or you don't. And that's up to you this morning. It's going to test the spirit that's in you. It's going to test it. He is the Almighty. There can only be one Almighty. Now here's what happened in my spirit when that finally, it's been a while back, but when it did, I said, I knew it! <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> I've known it all along! <laughs> but I comprehended it. At times I feel him pulling me up into a place I'm scared to death to go. And I just say, Lord, help me now here. He's the Almighty. Amen. Right? Yes. If your church, now listen, if your church does not preach, and I don't care you talking about him being the Son of God, you hadn't said anything, not, not today. And he's the Son of God, you know that. I don't deny it. Who are the, the Son of the living God? Sure he is. But he's not the Son of God like anybody else is the Son of God. But you go spout off all you want to about him being God. He may be one of the gods among many gods. 
Are you following me? But if your church cannot believe that Jesus Christ is the Almighty, He is Almighty God. There is none higher than Him. Now, they didn't say that about Him in that same sense when He was the God man on this earth because He said, Why call you me Lord? There's or good, there's just one good. He was proving something and hammering it out in his lifetime. And he finished that work. And the God-man ascended to the right hand of the Father. That mysterious being that we still cannot fully comprehend. But I will take what John says in Revelation and I'll take it. And whether I understand all of it or not, I'll just take it for what it says. He says that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Almighty. He's Almighty God. Now, did you accept that or reject it? Did you, did that repel you? Did you say, well, no, wait a minute, I can't go only so far with you, preacher. You're, going, you're, going, you're taking too big of a leap here. Then you don't have the Holy Ghost. Either that or you go home and get on your knees and you say, Lord God, that preacher got up there and said what he did this morning. Now, I want you to confirm that in my heart and in my soul. Is that true or is that not true? And if you are truly a believer and the Holy Spirit dwells within you, he will confirm to you who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is Almighty God. I'm going to close with this. i got four things. Real quickly, I just wanted to jot these down this morning. When I got into Revelation, I thought, i got to do this now. The book of Revelation reveals Christ in Revelation 1.8 as the Almighty. It's a revealer. It's revealing Him, right? It reveals Him as the Almighty. Revelation 4.11, it reveals Him as the Worthy One. He's worthy. He earned that right. In Revelation 5, he didn't earn to be almighty, but he earned the right to be the worthy one. In Revelation 5, 12, he's the powerful one because he's unleashing power. He opens the book. Then in Revelation 19, verse 11, he's the coming one. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Somebody said, there ain't no horses in heaven. Listen, folks. If he can say, let there be. <laughs> folks, he could say, all right, church, line up. And we all line up. He said, it's time to go back. What are we going to ride, Lord? Let there be a hundred million white horses. Bang. Snorting him, hoofing, stomping the ground. Ready to go. Amen. I marvel at people that put God in some kind of binding. Why, friend? If he, if, he, if he created everything he did, then you think it's a problem for him to make, a, to make us a, a, an army of horses? No. And I can't imagine what it's going to be. But when he comes back into the heavens, the first ones that are going to know that he's coming back are going to be the demons. Principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Can you imagine the face of a demon when it sees the Lord God Almighty and the heavens open up? And I mean unannounced, all of a sudden, bang, here comes a hundred million, I don't know how many, men, on, men and women on horseback coming out of heaven as an army from glory. While demons are going to be screaming and running wild, right to left, headed every way they can to get out of the way. For he's coming down and he's coming in power and great glory. He's coming again. He said, I will come again. I am coming the coming of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is an installment plan. Many things involved when it, different times. But this is the consummation. This is when it's all over. It's finished. It's done. There's no arguing. There's no mitigating circumstances. There's no appellate courts. This is it. He comes in power and great glory. And we're going to come with him. I can't change the world. But we're going to take it. I can't do anything about the devil's kingdom. But one day I'll reach forth with power and authority and violently rip it from his hands. And he'll take him and he'll take him and put him in a bottomless pit and bind him with chains for a thousand years. Rip him and humiliate him in front of his own armies. And he'll be cast into that pit and there he'll be. And the Lord Jesus Christ will walk through the same valley he walked through when he carried his cross. <laughs> He walked down the hill. He walked down when he went. He'll come to the same town he came to. He was at 2,000 years ago when they rammed that crown of thorns on his head and nailed him to a tree. 
But this time when he comes back, he comes back as the conquering Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Lord God Almighty. Amen. And when he sits down on that throne in Jerusalem, everything on this earth will fall before his feet and confess him to be the Lord God who he is. He's the Lord, friend. He asks no questions, gives no quarter, and takes no quarter. When he comes, he's coming as a commanding officer and all of his troops with him, and he'll finish it, and it'll be done, and he'll reign for a thousand years. Amen. You say, I don't believe all that stuff, preacher. I believe it, and I'll tell you the truth. I'll confess to you this morning. There's more to believe than I know. <laughs> there's more to know about it than I know. There's more to learn than I know, and the more you learn, the more God will bless you. Yeah. Father, in Jesus' name, Bless your word. And I believe you, and I believe in you. And I believe I'm talking to Almighty God.